but yeah, again, just so everybody knows, um, we are, um, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And again, we'll do our very best to get to as many of those as possible. All right, so my name is Jillian Morris. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids, and we've been hosting this series of webinars for a couple of weeks now. And I'm really excited for this one because it's something that I'm super interested in as well. So I hope you guys are as excited about this one. Um, and with us today, we have Dr. Chris Lowe from Cal State Long Beach. Um, and he's a professor in biology. Uh, and runs the lab there. And he and his students are using some really incredible technology from drones, looking at eDNA, uh, robotics, telemetry to study these incredible animals, different sharks and rays. And I think talking today about nursery areas, um, some of the main questions that scientists have about sharks in general include, where do they breed? Where do they give birth? And where are those nursery habitats? Because this is a critical, these are critical parts of their life. Um, and it's really important to understand that for conservation, management, and protection. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to let our guest, uh, Dr. Chris Lowe, take over and tell us all about White Shark Nurseries and his amazing research. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. And I hope everybody's home safe and busy studying, right? <laughs> okay, so hopefully today I'll be able to answer some of your questions, and I'm going to tell you a story about something that's happened in California. I've lived in California for 30 years, and I never thought I would see the day where I'd have baby white sharks off my beach. So it's been kind of a surprise for me, and it's been a kind of an exciting journey. So what I want to talk about today are white sharks, and they're the, you know, shark week quintessential species that everybody thinks about, right? And of course, we have to remember white shark and great white shark are the same species. There's only one species of white shark. They're found in all oceans around the planet and they're all called white shark. Scientists call them white sharks. Some people call them great whites, but they're the same species. Now, I live in California and I live in Southern California. So Disneyland is right around there. And of course, Southern California is renowned for its beaches. We have gorgeous beaches and there's sand and there's rock and there's great surf and all sorts of things. And for many years, people have been coming to Southern California to surf. It's one of the few places like Florida where you can be in the ocean all year round. So people are always out fishing and diving and surfing and swimming, using the ocean for a wide variety of reasons. And as somebody who's lived in California a long time, I've always been on the lookout for sharks in our local waters. And it's been the last 10 years that we've seen something interesting. So we also have some of the most populated beaches in the world. We have thousands of people that go to our beach every summer, every winter. What we have noticed probably in the last 10 years is something we hadn't seen before. And that was the occurrence of white sharks along our beaches, particularly small white sharks. And that got people really interested, but also a little scared because these sharks were actually very, very close to the shoreline. So we've been wondering, you know, why these sharks are showing up now? Where have they been? Have they always been here? What do they do while they're here? And is it safe for people to be in the water around all these young white sharks? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this story that we've been working on. But to start, we have to think about where white sharks have been and what's happened to them over time. So let's go back 300 years. Imagine we go back 300 years, there's nobody fishing or very few people hunting in the Pacific. This is what our Pacific food chain might look like. So we have lots of white sharks. And of course, those white sharks are feeding on seals and sea lions. And then of course, they're also feeding on fish, they're feeding on tuna, they're feeding on squid, all these different species. So before humans really started to hunt and take all these things out, this is what our food pyramid probably looked like in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, but then what started to happen was people started coming here and they started to harvest things like seals and sea lions. And in many cases, they hunted them largely for their fur because that was a warm coat that you could have in the winter, but also whales, seals also have a big blubber layer. So they had lots of fat and that fat was rendered down and it was used to, to light lamps. Back then we didn't have electricity and many people's homes were actually lit using seal oil or whale oil. So as the result of making coats and oil, we depleted. Hunters hunted out pretty much all the seals and great whales from our waters. So about 100 years ago, what we saw was this loss of these seals because of overhunting. 
And of course, if that's one of the things that white sharks like to eat the most, at least the adults do, there's less food for them. That means some of those white sharks are gonna disappear because there's not enough food for them. Then what we started to see was about 50 to 100 years ago, we started to see people starting to fish more along the West Coast. California was renowned for its commercial fisheries. And we fed a lot of people throughout the whole West Coast on, on fish that were caught off Southern California. So tuna and tuna fish sandwiches are favorite, right? Sharks were being caught, squid were being caught, and these are all things that white sharks eat. So if we look at about 50 years ago, remember we've already taken out all those seals and sea lions. Well, we've taken out all these tuna, we've taken out squid, and of course those seals and sea lions are feeding on those things and there's less of that food for them to eat. So in addition, we see more sharks disappearing because they're being caught. Yes, white sharks are being caught in commercial fisheries 50 years ago and were being landed and people were eating white shark and they didn't even know it. So what we've seen over the last 50 years is a very different ocean than what we had off California 300 years ago. So now what's happened is back in the 70s, we had hunted seals and sea lions and great whales to the verge of extinction. So we enacted protection for them in 1973. That was the Federal Marine Mammal Protection Act that was put in place in 1973. And you can see from this graph down here that by then many of these animals, their populations were very, very low on the verge of extinction. But since their protection, we've seen many of these animals' populations go way up. In fact, they've now gotten much, much higher. And of course, as a result, white sharks were protected also in California and throughout all US waters in 2005. So as a result, white sharks have been protected and they can no longer be caught by fishermen intentionally. They have to be let go if they're accidentally caught. So what we're starting to see are beaches loaded with seals, which is a good sign. That means the Marine Mammal Protection Act is working. And of course, white shark food source is coming back. So that means there's more white sharks. And of course, the Northern elephant seal is the white shark favorite. It is the fat, juiciest. Think of it as the best donut you could ever eat. That is the white shark food right there. Okay, so now what we might start to see is a population that looks more like this. The seals are coming back. And if the seals come back and the white sharks are protected, they come back too. So that's how we are starting to see more white sharks now, not just off California, off Massachusetts, off Florida, off the Gulf of Mexico, all those places because our ecosystem in some cases is getting better. Okay, so what do we know about white sharks in California? Well, what we've learned is that adult white sharks, back in the fall between about November and February, these northern elephant seals come back to these locations off the Farallon Islands and Unawewa Island off San Francisco. And they would come there, they'd mate, they give birth to their babies, and then they would take off. So biologists would see white sharks feeding on these animals around these locations. There's also a really cool island located off Baja, and that's another aggregation site where there's lots of seals and white sharks go there to feed as well. And in recent years, because the population is growing, we've been seeing a lot more white sharks around the Channel Islands and Point Conception. These are all places where seals aggregate to reproduce, produce their babies. And this is a great place for an adult white shark to come hunt a naive baby that's all fat and ready to go. So we've learned about this 25 years ago, but as the population is growing, we've learned a lot more about white sharks. So it's been technology that's changed our idea about white sharks. Originally, we thought they were coastal sharks. They were only along the coast. We'd see them primarily in the fall when their seals were there. But when the seals left, the sharks would kind of disappear. We didn't know where they went. So it wasn't until we started using technology like satellite transmitters, where my colleagues would go out and tag white sharks around the Farallon Islands and around those places, that we found that they would migrate out. When the seals would leave, they would migrate out to the middle of the Pacific halfway between Baja and Hawaii. And some of the sharks would spend eight months out there, others a year and a half before eventually returning back to one of those feeding aggregation sites along the coast. Or in some cases, females would come back and would start giving birth to their young. So one of the things that we've learned about white sharks, and this comes back to why we may be seeing more now, is white sharks in many ways are more like people. They have life history characteristics more like us. So for example, a white shark may not mature until it's about 12 to 14 years old. Females might even take longer to mature, but let's just say between 12 and 14 years old, males and females mature. Okay, a female can produce anywhere from two to 15 babies at a time. 
And because their gestation, their pregnancy is about 12 months, we think they give birth about every other year. Okay, so if these things can live to be seven years old, how many babies could a female potentially produce in her life, assuming all those babies lived? Okay, so here's a little math, right? So let's say a female takes 14 years to reach maturity. She can live to be 70, 70 minus 14. Okay, you do a little math on the, if she only has two pups a year versus 15 pups a year, that means a female can produce anywhere between 56 and 840 babies in her lifetime. But that all depends on how many babies she has per litter, whether all those pups survive. Now, if we compare that to something like a yellowfin tuna, the tuna fish sandwich that y'all love to eat, a yellowfin tuna can mature at four years old. They can produce 10 million eggs per year, but only 1% of those might actually survive. And then they breed constantly. They can breed all year round in some places in the ocean. And a yellowfin tuna is thought to live up to about 20 years old. So how many babies can they produce in their lifetime? Like 1.6 million babies in a tuna's lifetime. So that's why we can go out and catch so many tuna and not deplete their populations, but we can't catch that many white sharks because if you do, you quickly drive their population down. Okay, so let's get back to baby white sharks. Okay, so here we have a picture of a 16 foot white shark and that's about the typical size of a female at maturity. They mature around 14 feet long. So let's say 16 feet is your typical size. That picture you see down at the bottom is the size of a baby. They're about four feet long at birth. So anywhere between four to four and a half feet long. And remember, inside that body, that big body, she might have 15 of those babies crammed in there. So it'll take her 12 months to produce those babies. Now, we don't know exactly where white sharks mate, and we don't know where they give birth. We just know that starting in the spring, around this time of year, baby white sharks start showing up off Southern California beaches. Yes, that is a baby white shark and that is a big baby. And by the way, they don't like being hugged. So don't do this at home. Okay, so in Southern California, that's that area that kind of dents into the coastline. We mainly see babies along our beaches, but the adults and the sub-adults, the teenagers are typically further north along California coast or they use the offshore islands, but it is rare to see large white sharks along Southern California beaches. Every once in a while they'll pass through, but not long enough for us to think that fe big female white sharks are giving birth to their babies off our beaches. We just don't see that. And remember, there are 22 million people that live along the Southern California coast, planes and helicopters everywhere. So if big females were coming in to give birth to their babies along the beaches, somebody would have seen them. We don't see that. Okay, so because we see these babies along our beaches between May and about November, biologists have hypothesized that the Southern California bite, that area from Southern California down to mid-Baja, is the nursery for white sharks in the Northeast Pacific. So what is a nursery? Well, we think a nursery for sharks is a place where the young ones can be safe. It's where there are a few predators, females will come in, give birth to them, or they'll give birth to them somewhere else, and then those babies enter that habitat. And they use that habitat specifically because that's a safer place for them. In addition, they have to learn how to feed, and all sh no sharks have parental care. They have to do it all on their own. So they have to find a place where it's not only safe from big predators, they have to find a place where there's plenty of food. So the other thing that they're gonna need are good conditions to grow. So the most dangerous time for a baby shark is its first year. So baby sharks grow like crazy. And they, as long as there's plenty of food and the conditions are good, so animals grow better in warmer water, if the water's warmer and not too hot, they can actually grow the fastest. So a lot of times these nurseries are places that are safe, have lots of food, and are warmer. So we think that's one of the reasons why Southern California is the favorite place for white sharks to give birth to their young. The other thing that we've learned over time from observation is that these babies tend to aggregate. They cause the, they form these small groups. So here's an aerial photograph taken off one of our Southern California beaches. And literally the beach is just off the screen. You see two stand up paddle boarders paddling around down there. How many baby white sharks do you see in this picture? Five. We've seen up to 15 baby white sharks in the area of two football fields, literally just out off the beach. 
So why are they using these beach habitats? So here's a nice aerial photograph of a couple of white sharks kind of doing a dosy -si do swim around each other. And we don't know why they do that either. One thing we do know is we typically don't see them right next to each other. They're kind of spread out. So the question that we're trying to answer is why they get so close to the beach? Why do we see them literally sometimes 50 feet off the shoreline? Remember, these are babies that are four to five feet long, but we see one-year-olds, two-year-olds, and three-year-olds that are five, six, seven feet long, just off these beaches, all kind of hanging out in these loose aggregations. So we have three hypotheses as to why they do this. One, this is a safe place for a white shark. Now, most people go, whoa, you know, a five-foot shark is not small. What would it possibly be afraid of? But adult white sharks will also eat their young. Most sharks are cannibalistic. They will eat babies if they get an opportunity. So one reason why baby white sharks might be coming in so close to our beaches is it's very shallow and it's a safer place for them. There are fewer big predators there. The other thing is they have to learn how to eat. And we, when we look at what we found in baby white shark stomachs over the years, the number one thing we find in their stomachs are stingrays. And we have millions of stingrays along Southern California beaches. More people are injured by stingrays in Southern California than by any other form of marine life. And these are littering the bottom. So these white sharks can literally, these babies that are trying to figure out how to feed, can literally swim along and, and scoop up these things like pancakes off the bottom. The third hypothesis as to why they're right along the beach is it's warmer there than it is 100 yards or 200 yards offshore. So this might provide them a nice warm abundant food source, little nursery for them to rapidly grow in their first year. So to answer questions about how much time they spend there and, and how do they move between these habitats, we use a variety of technologies. So one type we use are called spot tags. These are satellite tags that can be bolted onto the shark's dorsal fin. And every time the fin breaks a surface, that radio transmitter will send up radio signals to satellites in orbit. And when that's detected, I will get an email at my office saying shark number 205 just popped up at this latitude and longitude, this time and date. But the minute that thing goes underwater, it turns off because radio waves cannot transmit through seawater. So unfortunately, these things are not marine mammals. They don't have to come to the surface to breathe. So we need other forms of technology that can help us track them when they're not just at the surface. So the other type of tag we use are called PAT tags, pop-off archiving satellite tags. And these can get darted into the shark's back and they hang off kind of like an earring. And these tags have a depth sensor, a temperature sensor, and a light sensor. And it has a little computer on board. And as the shark's swimming along, it's recording all that information. And then at a pre-described time and date, it's designed to pop off, float to the surface, upload all that data to the satellite, which then sends it to me in my office. So by using that information, we can kind of figure out where the shark is. We know the temperature and the depth of the water that it moved through. But if we really want to know how close the shark is getting to the beach, we use what is known as acoustic telemetry. So acoustic transmitters are different from satellite transmitters in that they're using longer wavelengths. They're using sound waves instead of radio waves. So those sounds are produced by the transmitter. They transmit through the water. And then you have to have a listening station. So we have acoustic receivers all along Southern California beaches, constantly listening for our tag sharks. Now, if we can catch the little babies, we can flip them upside down, put them in tonic immobility, and surgically implant a transmitter, acoustic transmitter, into their body cavity that will stay in there forever. That transmitter will last 10 years. So anytime that tag shark swims within about 300 yards of one of our acoustic receivers, the receiver will log the time, the date, and the ID number of that shark. So it's kind of like easy pass on the toll road. It's, it's a way of keeping track of how many sharks come by and when. So in addition, we can also dart tags into the shark's backs. So we don't have to catch them to do that. And then every time they swim by, they'll get logged by the acoustic receiver as well. And then we have another device called smart tag that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So by using all this technology it enables us to follow these sharks around and see where they go. But quite often, we either have to catch them first or get close enough to tag them. So we use a variety of methods in order to do this. And remember, we're doing this right off a public beach. So we always work very closely with our local lifeguards when we do this. Now, in some cases, commercial fishermen accidentally catch the sharks. And they'll call us up and say, hey, I caught a baby white shark. My team and I will race down. We'll measure the shark. We'll take blood samples and tissue samples, we'll tag the shark, take it out, let it go, and then see where it goes. Another method we could use for the bigger sharks is called jab tagging. 
This is where we get up alongside them in a, either on a jet ski or a boat. We can sneak up alongside and we can dart a tag into the shark's back. And we can use the drone to estimate how big that shark is. Another method is called strike netting. This is where we put a piece of gill net, fine net right in front of the shark and the shark swims into it and gets entangled. And then we can take the shark out and then work the shark up. But the other one, this is my student's favorite. It's called jab tagging. You'll love this. So basically you're on the back of a jet ski and we have a helicopter or drone spot the shark for the jet ski operator. They can slip into the water and then we can dart a tag into the shark's back. So we can do this very quickly. Remember, if there's an aggregation of sharks along the beach, we can tag five or six sharks in just a couple hours. Now what's amazing is that student right now is standing. They are chest deep. That's how shallow the water is that these young white sharks are using. Okay, so one of the things that we've learned from the satellite transmitters is that typically what juvenile white sharks are born in the summer, they're hanging out off Southern California beaches, but in the winter when our water temperatures start to cool down, those babies book it south to Baja. So here we have a map, we have a date counter and the map's gonna change color based on the water temperature. The redder the color, the warmer, the bluer, the colder, and you're gonna see a black smudge there so now what you're seeing is this baby is tagged in August up off Southern California. That black smudge means the shark's somewhere in the middle of that area. But now as we get to October, the water temperature starts cooling down. See how it starts to get greenish blue? And that shark starts migrating south. And it gets down to an area called Vizcayano Bay off Baja. So that shark did that in response to water temperature. Pretty much every single baby white shark that we have tagged had done this behavior in the winter. When the water temperature dipped below 60 degrees, that was just too cold, they all moved south. A couple of years ago, we had an opportunity to do a really cool experiment. We had a white shark that was caught in Southern California that was taken up to Monterey Bay Aquarium and kept in their big tank exhibit for five months. That shark gained 100 pounds in five months. It was the best fed white shark probably in the world. So they released that white shark in Monterey Bay in February where the water temperature is 50 degrees. So you're gonna see the black smudge up there off Monterey, watch the, watch the clock. Oh my goodness, they don't like cold water. That shark booked it all the way down and had to go all the way almost to Mazatlan, Mexico. Now what you're gonna see is in April, there's a slug of warm water that comes up into the Gulf of California and it does this every year during the summer months. And what happens is you see is that red water's coming up that water is actually too warm and it's pushing the shark up into the Gulf. Right before that tag was scheduled to pop off, that shark started hanging out at a depth of about 150 feet where the water temperature was 70 degrees. So what this experiment taught us was that white sharks are kind of like the three bears. Babies don't like it too cold and they don't like it too warm. They like it between 60 degrees and about 72 degrees. That's their favorite. Okay, the other thing that we found was that things like El Nino, where our seasons can really get screwed up. So during strong El Ninos, water temperatures remain really high even during the winter months in Southern California. So what you're gonna see now is an animation. You're gonna see a little time and date counter up there at the top of the graph. And those little acoustic receivers are at those little red rings you see. And what you're gonna see is every time you see a flash, that was a white shark being detected with a transmitter. So what you can see is these sharks are kind of moving along these beaches. Some are staying there for long periods of time. And then they'll leave one beach and they'll go to another beach. Now those beaches are about 60, 70 miles apart. So these sharks are hopscotching from one hotspot beach to another. And they do this typically all summer long. But what was really different about 2015 was we had a strong El Nino. And as we got to winter, our water temperatures never got below 65 degrees. Well, what was really interesting about 2015, none of the sharks left. They never migrated to Baja, they all stayed. So this taught us a lot about how baby white sharks are influenced, not just by water temperature, but by climate. So one of the questions we really wanna know is, why do they pick a certain beach and why do they leave one beach and go to another beach? So to answer that question, we're using a, a wide range of technology. We're using underwater robots that I'll talk more about. We're using satellite transmitters. We're using acoustic transmitters. We have special tracking technology that will track sharks with acoustic transmitters at a beach. We have drones that we fly over top so we can count how many sharks are there and estimate their size without actually having to catch them. In addition, we also have a buoy that has a receiver on it. And every time a tag shark goes by, it'll send me a text alert telling me when that shark is at that buoy. And we share that information with local lifeguards. 
And of course, we can also take water samples and collect DNA. So what we have happen, we have an aggregation show up at a Southern California beach. My team and I go out. We tag as many other sharks as we can. We can put out an array of acoustic receivers. And every time a shark's detected by an, three acoustic receivers or more, we can estimate a position for that shark. So we can track that whole aggregation as it moves along that beach. Now, while we're tracking that shark using that technology, we're also flying drones above the sharks, counting how many sharks are there, using the drones to estimate their size, and then seeing what they're doing in proximity to people or other marine life. We also have something called an AUV. An AUV is an autonomous underwater vehicle. So it's got a full set of environmental sensors on its nose. So it can measure water temperature, water depth, turbidity, chlorophyll, how much plant materials in the water, oxygen concentration, and pH. And we can program the robot to go out and it will swim in a lawnmower pattern along that beach, move up and down through the water column and characterize all those water column characters as it's in and amongst the aggregation. So we can have a high resolution 3D map of the environmental conditions. Now we can also mount on that AUV underwater cameras that are forward facing, downward facing. So we can use that to map out how many stingrays are in that area or how many fish are in the water column. So in addition, we can also tag some of the sharks with our smart tags and follow the sharks around either using our AUV or from a boat and we get a really high resolution track and a camera on the sharks so we can see what the shark sees. And then lastly, we can take water samples around where that shark is and measure white shark eDNA in the water. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So a few years ago, we actually worked with a, a roboticist at Harvey Mudd College and we got money to build a shark tracking robot. So this is a rob autonomous robot that has all those sensors on it that we talked about. But this robot we actually use to track a leopard shark. So what you're gonna see is an animation. The red dots are where the robot thinks the leopard shark is. The blue is the robot. And we program the robot to swim in a circle near the shark. It knows exactly where the shark is. That shark is somewhere in the cluster of red of dots. That's the estimated position. And as the shark doesn't go anywhere, the robot just stays next to it and moves around in circles. If the shark starts swimming towards the robot, the robot's programmed to move away. But if the shark starts swimming away, like you'll see in a minute, the robot will start to follow it again until the shark stops, and then it will start circling again. So by doing this, we don't have to be out in the boat following the shark. The robot can do that. So the robot can do something we can't do. It can swim and chew gum at the same time. It can measure all those water column parameters, plus know exactly where the shark is in 3D space. This helps us begin to answer questions about how the shark is making decisions about what's happening around it. So the other tool that we use are called shark selfie stations. These are also called brubs. You probably heard about these. Um, these are beta remote underwater video systems. So over here on the left, we have basically a PVC pole with a T-bar and two GoPro cameras. So my students will swim outside the wave break where the sharks are hanging out and they'll stick that in the sand and they'll point one camera towards the beach and the other one offshore. And we turn the cameras on, we just let them run. There's no bait because this is a public beach. We don't want to be chumming off a public beach. We turn the cameras on and it turns out the sharks are actually curious of the cameras and they'll swim up and they'll actually take a selfie. So we can have my students go through and grab those frames and then we can identify individuals because they have unique white and gray marks along their face, along their fins, and along their tail. And we can use that to build facial libraries of white sharks. So now we're working with computer scientists to develop facial recognition software for white sharks. So we can build a library and we can track them over time. So another tool we use are drones. So drones have become a very powerful tool in science. Um, we have to be very careful. All my people are FAA certified pilots, um, but we can use that to do surveys along beaches. And we can use that for two reasons. One, we can count how many people are in the water. We don't even know how many surfers or swimmers or bathers are in the water and under different water conditions, but also when are they in the water with sharks? So again, by using drone technology, we can basically follow sharks around. We can identify sharks. We can even use customized software to tell us that's a white shark and not a leopard shark or a smooth hound shark. We can see how the sharks respond to things like jet skis or people. And in addition, we can develop other specialized software that enables us to track all the individual sharks and ask, do they wanna to be together? Are they just hanging out in the same area because it's all warm in this area? 
or are they actually hanging out together? So by using this technology, we can answer questions we just couldn't answer five years ago. Okay, so the other technique that we've developed is something called eDNA screening for white sharks. So a couple of years ago, we had a group of white sharks hanging out off the beach in Southern California. We went out, we put tags in them, we had listening stations out there listening to them. And we wanted to see if we could detect white shark DNA in the water. So to do that, you go out, you basically take a little water bottle and you fill that water bottle up and we can screen through that water bottle and that water bottle full of seawater taken just outside the surf zone is basically a DNA soup. It's got bacteria DNA, it's got plankton DNA, it's got human DNA, it's got marine mammal DNA, it's got fish DNA, and it has white shark DNA. So if we know what specific pieces of DNA match that just of white shark, we can develop specific primers that we can go out, take a water sample, and ask, is there any white shark DNA in this water at this time? So we actually did a study and we confirmed that the only time we actually detected white shark DNA was in the water where we were detecting white sharks. Whereas down the beach a half mile where we never detected them or never saw them with our drone, we measured no white shark DNA in the water. So this is a really exciting tool because it means we might be able to use this as a monitoring tool of Southern California beaches. Lifeguards could literally go out, take a water sample and screen that for white shark DNA. But we have to know, number one, how long will that DNA last in the water? How far away from the white shark can we detect it? Can we use that to estimate how many white sharks are in the water? And we have to do these experiments in order to determine whether this tool will work. Now, if it does, we have another cool autonomous robot with water samplers on it that we can program to go out and suck up water at different places along the beaches and then run that across a PCR machine to determine whether we're detecting white shark in the water in real time. Cool, cool new technology. Okay, so the bottom line is, we're using all these tools to figure out what's going on, but at the same time, millions and millions of people are using Southern California beaches. And there are a lot of moms worried about, can, it's, is it okay for my kids to go swimming or surfing here, even though we know there are these white sharks along the beach. So what we're trying to do is work closely with lifeguards and get our science out to the public so they can make the decision. So we have things called shark shacks where we go out and we, we take these to all the local beaches during the summer. Many of my students and high school volunteers come out and help. And we use that to educate the public about what we're learning about white sharks. And so far what we've learned is that even though there may be an aggregation of white sharks and there are people in and amongst those white sharks all the time, they seem to ignore people. So that's good news, but we don't know whether that's gonna change over time. So we're constantly doing more research to figure that out. In addition, to help educate kids, we've developed a comic book. So the comic book is called Beach Days Share the Waves, and it teaches kids about all sorts of ocean safety things, not just about sharks, because we don't want to just scare people about sharks, but we talk about rip currents and how to get out of rip current. We talk about stingrays and sea jellies, all sorts of things that you know, are common in our local ocean that people should know about so that when you use the ocean, you can do so safely. And we have to be able to share the waves. The fact that sharks are coming back is a good sign, and it's something we should all be excited about. So with that, thank you. Hopefully you have some good questions. Great. There we go. Thank you so much. Really, really interesting. I think especially uh, just seeing how technology is changing. And, and I always talk about what a phone can do now. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't just make phone calls or text message. You can upload a video and check the internet, order from Amazon, which probably a lot of people are doing right now. Um, so yeah, it's just incredible that as technology is changing, now it's being uh, kind of uh, shaped to be able to help study these incredible animal sharks all over the world. And um, also kind of non-invasive, not always having to catch them to learn a lot about them, which is really interesting as well. So uh, we do have lots of great questions. Uh, the first one though, and it seems to be a very popular one is, what is your favorite shark? Is it a white shark? Actually, no. <laughs> um, you know, a long time ago, I swore I would never study white sharks because I thought they were kind of overrated. And um, I, it was when I saw my first baby white shark that I changed my mind. They are too cute. They really are very, very cute. Um, my favorite is actually the cookie cutter. That is by far, in my opinion, the coolest shark on the planet. When you think about it, it's 18 inches long. It can take bites out of anything in the ocean. 
Um, and it just takes a little nibble. It doesn't have to consume or kill its prey to, to sustain itself. It just takes a little nibble. Right. Um, so do you have, we had somebody just pop up and see how can they get a copy of that comic book? Is there a link that you can share or is there a, a place that they can go that I could actually type in the message? So we just got some money to produce more. Um, we ran out last year and we're going to start shipping those out to various places uh, across the country. And then hopefully next year it'll be available online electronically, but right now it's only available on paper. So if people contact me um, via the Shark Lab, um, we'll, we'll see what we could do, get those to their communities. Um, we really wanna get it in kids' hands. So, and it works anywhere you go. We're sending a bunch to South Africa even. Very cool. Yeah, I think uh, we're excited to check those out as well. So we'll definitely um, make sure people have that. And I'm just gonna type it in for those of you. I'll type that in the, um, in the chat bar. So uh, no. All right, one of the questions was, um, I assume they're talking about the pop-off tag. So the PSAT, when it pops off, what happens? Do you get it back? Uh, does it sink? They wanna know what happens to it. Great question. So pop-off satellite tags are designed to float. So the idea is when it pops off the animal, it floats up to the surface and only the, really the antenna is sticking out of the water. And the antenna is the part that communicates then with the satellite. Now, where this gets tricky is sometimes the longer we have those satellite tags out, barnacles, algae begin to grow on those, and sometimes they don't float properly. Or if the seas are really rough when it pops off and the satellite tag is being bounced all around, every time that antenna goes underwater, it can't communicate. In addition, we have satellites in orbit that aren't always in a position where they can hear the tag. So sometimes tags float around out in the ocean for days or if not weeks before we can download all the data. Now, sometimes we have special radio receivers that we can go out and we can get those tags back. So imagine going out 30 or 40 miles offshore, looking for this little tiny string antenna sticking up. We can use that receiver to find it. And if we get that satellite tag back, we get back all the data that were stored. So what gets uploaded via the satellite is only a small proportion, a summary of the data. But if we can get the tag back, we get all of that data record. It's kind of like a treasure hunt. Um, I've been on those and I know it's, it's really exciting when you get those tags back. It's definitely Absolutely. not really valuable to anyone else, but very, nope. very valuable to uh, the science team just because there's so much more information on there. Great questions. All right, do you have, Aiden wants to know, uh, do you have one of these tags that's your favorite or maybe that you use most often or do they all kind of work together? Well, they all kind of work together. So some of the tags that we use, like for example, our smart tag um, is a, a customized tag package that we clamp on the shark's dorsal fin. I apologize, I meant to show a picture of that. It, and it's got a video camera so we can see down the shark's nose. It's got a 3D accelerometer, a 3D gyroscope and a 3D magnetometer. So it has a little compass on it right? And it's got an acoustic transmitter on it and it clamps on the dorsal fin like a little backpack. So the shark will carry that for about 24 hours. After 24 hours, that pops off and floats up and we can pick it up and download it. So it acts like a Fitbit. So what we've found, we've tagged three baby white sharks with, with our little smart, pack, smart tag packages. And what we found was really interesting. So we got the video back and we're looking at the video and, and it almost looked like the camera got bumped. So the camera angle was at like a 45 degree angle. And we kept looking at it and looking at scrubbing through the video. And then all of a sudden the video went from one angle to another. And then we couldn't really figure out whether the camera's loose and rocking in the package or whether the shark was actually swimming on its side. When we downloaded the accelerometer data, the accelerometer data told us that the shark was actually swimming in a 45 degree bank in a tight circle, about a 30 foot diameter circle. And it would swim in that circle in one direction for about 20 minutes. And that, that whole thing would move over time and over depth. And then after 20 minutes, it would reverse and go the opposite direction. I mean, almost a perfect circle, like a plane and a bank. And then after 20 minutes, it would go back the other way. For four hours, it did this. So two different sharks that we tagged with a smart tag were showing this behavior. And we, we were following the shark in a boat. We couldn't tell exactly what it was doing. So my students got really excited about this. And it turns out there are birds that migrate that fly continuously while they migrate. They're constantly flying. And what they do is they turn off half their brain and they will fly in a circle in one direction. 
then they'll turn off the other half of their brain and fly in the opposite direction. So by doing this, they're still able to fly and they're still paying attention to where they are. But that is basically how these birds sleep. So dolphins, whales do the same thing. They can turn off half their brain and then kind of move up and down the water column, pay attention to what's happening around them. For a white shark that never stops swimming in order to breathe, we think that this might be some of the first evidence of how they sleep. So if we didn't have that smart tag, that, that really cool Fitbit, we would have never been able to determine that's exactly what they were doing while they're moving around in the space. Yeah, it's really interesting. We've actually seen some of the hammerheads in, in Bimini uh, do the same thing. Um, my husband actually had really cool drone footage of one coming up to the surface and to going on that angle and actually going down, hitting the bottom, coming back up. But yeah, possibly the same thing, kind of having a bit of a rest as they're they're cruising along. And uh, yeah, really, really incredible to see that on the fin cameras as well, that, that yep. very distinct sharp angle, but really cool. All right. Um, so Paolo wants to know, how do you filtrate the shark DNA from other organisms DNA when you're collecting the water samples? Really good that's question. Great, that's a great question. So you have, imagine this seawater sample that's got all this DNA soup in it, right? So there are all these little pieces of DNA. And, and what you need is a really specific primer that only, a little piece of DNA that will only bind to white shark DNA. So we have to find just the right little pieces of DNA that are only found in white sharks. And, we, and this was hard because right off our beaches, we also have mako sharks, which are closely related to white sharks. So we had to take white shark DNA and amplify and find just the right little primers that we could then run that soup across and then see where those little pieces bind. So by binding to it, that meant that was a white shark specific piece of DNA. So that method requires us to amplify all the DNA that was in the soup, produce these primers, see where they bind, and then using those to say, okay, we've got three bound pieces. There were three pieces of white shark DNA specifically in that soup. Cool, all right. And then a few people have asked, does, do the tags or the tagging, does that hurt the sharks? Well, that's another really good question. That's something we're always worried about. So we spend most of our time being, trying to develop methods that are the most caring for the animal. So what's the easiest way to capture the animal that does the least amount of stress? Um, what's the best way to handle the animal? Should we ever take the animal out of the water? And because we're working with babies um, that are very small, we've built these special water baths for them. So even when we're working on them, they're always in a water bath and we're always moving water across the whole body. The animal's always submerged. When we do the surgery, we just raise the body up. So just the belly is out of the water um, because we don't want to put any undue pressure on the animal. In addition, we can take blood samples and we can use those blood samples to evaluate how stressed the animal may be. So all the methods that we use, we try to look for that. Now, when we dart tags in, quite often the animals will flinch. But then again, if you've ever had your ears pierced, you know, you do feel a little pinch. So we think in many ways, it's very akin to that. But there are some things that we won't do anymore. For example, we learned that when we put the spot tags, when we bolted those on the fins, that those did a lot of damage to the fins because we recaptured a shark later. And as a result, I'll never tag a small shark with a, a satellite tag like that again. It just does too much damage to the fin. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to find some other way to track smaller sharks, at least that's my opinion. But for the bigger ones who have big, tough, gnarly fins, they can probably take it, but the smaller sharks can't. Right, so Ethan and his dad want to know if there are other species that follow similar patterns to the white sharks. You've mentioned a couple of the leopard sharks, uh, makos offshore. Are you seeing similar migrations or movements? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. And that's the really cool thing. So Southern California is that little notch in the West Coast that kind of notches in. And what happens is we get cool Alaska water coming down along the coast of California. But then you get a countercurrent that comes up into Southern California bringing warm water. And mako sharks, thresher sharks, salmon sharks, white sharks, blue sharks, all use the, the Northeast Pacific as their home, but they all use the Southern California bite as their nursery. And we think that's because in the summer it gets warmer and the productivity, there's more food for all those babies. So all those species, even the ones that are pelagic offshore, 
still use the Southern California bite as their nursery in the summer because it is so productive. Great. All right, just answering a few of these. Um, let's go back. There was one about the AUV. Um, do you have to move the AUV or does it move on its own? Or do you sort of program it to go through a specific area? So it's basically like a little torpedo that one person can pick up and drop in the water. And we can program it when it's in the water. We can tell it to go out and go to these lat long uh, waypoints and it will go swim those positions. It'll go underwater. When it goes underwater, we can't talk to it. Um, we can talk to it acoustically, but when it's in the air, we can talk to it via Wi-Fi. So we have our computer on the boat and we can tell it what to do. And when it pops up to the surface to get a new GPS location, we can give it new instructions. Once it's programmed, it can run for eight to 10 hours completely on its own. It will avoid obstacles. So if it starts heading towards something, it has sonar in the front. So if a boat's coming at it and it gets in front of it, it will deviate its path, it will change its path. So it, it has a lot of those features already built into it, but we've kind of tricked it out. We've customized it so it can track sharks too. And are you still somebody, Owen asked if you're still, is that a tool that you're regularly using as well, still using now? Yeah, absolutely. So, and we, we just got another robot. So we're in the process of developing new tools. Um, and this is, this is something I always tell students, look, you know, you can be interested in marine biology and want to study sharks, but you know what we're looking for? We're looking for hybrids. We're looking for people that have interest and background in physics and electronics and engineering and computer science. Because these days, the, the technologies that we use to study these animals require greater knowledge of these kinds of technologies. So um, I have lots of engineering and computer science students that work in my lab who are, are phenomenal programmers and, and, and engineers. Um, they don't really know much about marine biology, but my students don't know really that much about computer science either. So by them working together, they've made a really powerful team. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I got to see Remus, the camera that actually follows as well, and it's just yeah, it's really amazing when those worlds are coming together with uh, and combining. Yeah, to create this amazing technology that there isn't, um, it's not been done before, and it's no so no one knows what we're going to find out. And I think that's really exciting for all the students watching out there too that. If you pursue a degree or you want to work with sharks, you don't necessarily have to be a marine biologist. Mm -hmm. There are other options and ways. If you're really good with um, building things or mechanical, then you might develop a new tag or a new mm -hmm. piece of equipment. And so that's really important to remember if you're interested in working with these animals, there's lots of different ways to get involved and approach studies. And it's really interesting um, seeing, I think your study probably highlights just how important technology is and how many different uses you are bringing together to study one species. I mean, more or less once, you know, when we're talking about the white sharks, but yeah, it's, it's really incredible. I think for, for students to see just the different options as well. And you know, it goes beyond that. So we use artists. We, we need ways of communicating to the public how this technology works and we need people that can do graphics. Um, we need to provide them with examples that we might not be able to get video for. So uh, we work a lot with graphic artists and animators to help us with those tools. Um, we also work with communicators. Um, most scientists are not really trained to do, you know, communication or marketing. Um, so we work with those people. And then because sharks interact with people all the time and they get a very bad rap about that, we also work with sociologists and psychologists to better understand how people react to sharks and how do we educate them and how do we how do we get people to understand they're not as dangerous as they're made out to be so by working with all these different people who they're not marine biologists but they have an interest in sharks we have the ability to answer more questions than i could ever answer in my life cool um, just a couple more. So um, are you ever scared to go in the water with sharks? That's a question I think most of our, our guests have been asked just because I think people want to know because there is a lot of misinformation about sharks out there and they're portrayed as monsters and manatees. And you talked about your public outreach and education. It's just, um, you know, a lot of the work that we do is really to help people understand how incredible these animals are and how important they are. But have you, are you afraid? Have you been afraid to be in the water with them? No, I actually feel really comfortable in the water. And I think a lot of that comes 
back to, to understanding. Like when we see a shark and we see what the shark is doing, you begin to interpret that body language, right? You, you, you can assess that situation. So imagine walking down a road and you encounter a dog and the dog is wagging its tail and it's, you know, it's acting friendly. We know that the dog is acting friendly. You could walk up to the dog and you show them the back of your hand, let the dog sniff your hand. People that are comfortable around dogs recognize that language and they feel comfortable. You can tell when a dog's upset, when a dog's afraid, and all you have to do is back off. So, you know, I, I, if we educate people to understand shark behavior the same way we understand dog behavior, uh, a, a whole lot more people would not be as afraid of getting in the water. Our job as somebody who studies sharks is to better help people understand what that body language means. So when people see a shark, they can better interpret that and, and feel more comfortable when they're in those situations. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's, you know, we hear mindless eating machines and just this idea that they're not an intelligent animal, but they have personalities. And mm -hmm. you can see that when you start spending time with, and you guys may be observing that even just from the drones, watching if, if the similar sharks are um, with the acoustic tags, are they are they social? Are they mm -hmm. hanging out? And and so I think it's really interesting for people to, to think about that because it's not necessarily something when you say sharks, you think of personality or um, behavior or intelligence, but it, they are, they're extremely intelligent and they, they have, some of them have really big, bold personalities, which is, mm -hmm. is, is really interesting. All right, so I'm gonna finish off with this last question, which I think is um, really a great question to kind of wrap up the why of this work. Uh, what are your future plans for these nursery areas? So I guess like, is it the hopes to get larger scale protection? Uh, you know, management, different seasons to protect the sharks. Is, is that the, what's the goal with knowing this information? So right now, white sharks are already protected in California. And what we're already experiencing is it is illegal for a fisherman to deliberately go out and target and catch a white shark. Now, as the population's grown and there's more fishing going on, more fishermen are accidentally catching white sharks. So we do a lot of education about that educating fishers on where they shouldn't be fishing if you don't want to catch a white shark, what's the best gear to use, what's the safest way to release a white shark if you accidentally catch one, and what is the penalty if you do catch one and you do kill it. So there's a lot of education that, that's needed. Now, many of these sharks are picking beaches that are some of the most public crowded beaches in the world. And despite the fact that many people would wish for them to go away, they're not. Um, but they're, at the same time, they're not going to close those beaches because they bring in millions and millions of dollars to those communities. And from what we've seen so far, the sharks seem to be unperturbed by the people. So at that point, that, that's actually a good sign. That means that people and sharks can interact in a way that nobody's hurting anybody else. And as long as that's the case, it's okay. When we have situations where fishermen are fishing off a beach or fishing off a pier and chumming to draw sharks in around places where people are swimming and surfing, that's different. And that's gonna require new legislation and new regulations to prevent people from getting hurt because one water user group is trying to do something that's gonna put another water user group in danger. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. A lot of really, really incredible and interesting uh, research that's happening, uh, you know, very important. And maybe uh, we have quite a few people uh, joining us from that area. So it's really important for them to know. But no matter where you are, if you go to the beach, it's it's important to understand what's happening in that that area. So um, thank you so much to everyone who joined us and, and really a special thanks uh, to Dr. Chris Lowe uh, for taking the time to share all this incredible research with us. Uh, you guys make sure um, if you want to watch this again, it will be on our YouTube channel. So if you miss something, you want to go back and see all the cool technology again, definitely go back and, and check that out. And if you do have additional questions, feel free. You can message us through the website. Uh, we can try and answer or pass along as well. But thank you again to everybody that joined us. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chris Lowe from uh, the Cal State Long Beach Shark Lab. Thank you, guys.